So if you're not, material is not accessible via Google, it's as if you don't exist to a huge portion of academe. So uh, you know, I've been on the faculty for 14 years, and since that very first year, whenever I had the opportunity to post my material online, I would do that, my, my scholarly research work. And in several cases, since I'd been doing this for quite some time, I was the first person that asked the journal, and they reworked their policy, or they gave me written permission to be able to do that. I can say as a result, um, you know, bumped up my citation count. Um, that's sort of a cynical way to look at it. I think the most important thing as faculty members is people are reading your work. You spend so much time on it. Um, you know, hopefully you're proud of the work that you're doing. You want it to be accessible. And um, you know, Google is a huge engine around that. And I think it's very positive that, for instance, the American Economic Association has now started four new journals, uh, sort of second tier journals, um, that uh, that are uh, open access and that uh, that essentially uh, are trying to draw some of the best work away from the for-profit sector because I think ultimately we all recognize the the for-profit journal publishing industry is uh, you know is is not a sustainable model uh, in economic terms you know if healthcare will eat up the entire GDP of the U.S. in 50 years, journal publishers will eat up the entire library budget of everybody in, in the country uh, in shorter time than that. And, uh, you know, that can't happen. When I got involved with it was I, about uh, oh, early 2000 or thereabouts when uh, I had uh, quite a few articles and publications relating to one major figure I work on, Ibn Arabi, and there's an Ibn Arabi society. and. I remember at one point saying, you know, why don't we take some of these things that are in your journal that only go to, you know, 150 university libraries and try and put them up online on the website and see what happens. And I think the first month we had 2,000 downloads and the, and the next month there were 10,000. And of course, most of these were from people who would never have had, uh, around the world, who would never have had access to the to the articles, and to, because the journal is goes to university libraries, so uh, that really sold me on it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a conversion experience. Or even in different communities, rural communities, and, and whatnot, even high schools, you could have a lot of different access points to a lot of different types of information through open access that would hopefully uh, contribute to the the academic welfare, the the, the social and uh, spiritual welfare of people in, in the world. So we are definitely committed to it, not only from the point of view of what BC is all about, but I think what, um, what our uh, Jesuit Catholic mission is, um, uh, we're compelled to do as, um, as members of this BC community and as, as part of the library community. Open access uh, allowed us to rethink what is it that our purpose is. Uh, and providing an international readership, providing a broader readership, inviting a much broader group of, of folks that could perhaps participate in, in the conversation. Uh, so it completely reinvented uh, our, our whole thinking about how it is that we publish scholarship and how it is that this Catholic journal fit into the open access model, which gave us a, a great platform for both access, a new business model, uh, and an appeal to our, our sense of sort of justice in the, in the terms of, of new scholarship accessibility uh, authorship, uh, ownership, uh, and a new distribution, a new distribution model. For those people who are outside of the academic community right now, in some cases just simply somebody who's graduated, they don't have access to most journals online. And that's a huge problem for those who want to maintain their scholarship or maintain their, their ties within the scholarly world. Whereas an open access journal, which is just there on the internet, is available beyond, beyond the access through specific university libraries. Uh, so that creates a very different dynamic. I suspect most people not in university don't know it exists and don't know that there's these resources out there that they could go learn about stuff without having to pay or be affiliated with a university or a company that pays to use it. They can get sort of initial aspects of knowledge by looking at these, what, what papers are out there. These are all basically proposed papers, right? They're all preprints. But, uh, you know, it's, it's free and open to everybody. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a useful thing throughout the world. So I, I encourage everybody to use it. Uh, all the colleagues I know do support the open access. I've never 
heard of anyone uh, being opposed <laughs> to that or supporting uh, <laughs> restricted access. No, everybody is happy and encouraging that. Uh, maybe it's not well known enough. I mean, many colleagues believe, for instance, that they are uh, giving away their copyright on their intellectual production as soon as they are publishing it somewhere, which is not true systematically. <laughs> or uh, you can negotiate <laughs> uh, retaining some uh, form of copyright. First thing that comes to mind is the Light the World campaign and slogan for the university, the idea that a university and its mission to research, to teach, to educate is in service to in making the world better for not just our students but for the broader communities, Boston, national and international that we're a part of. Open access seems to connect very nicely to that larger institutional value, the idea that the work that we're doing here as students, as faculty across our departments, across the schools, holds the power to make a difference in the lives of people all across the globe. Open access seems to encourage those best aspects of Jesuit higher education. 